Hey, this is Joel Ellis. I'm here to let you know that the Nothing Shocking podcast is truly rocking. Uh, we're going to talk about my band's heavy bones, cats and boots, Mary hoax, and all the other fun stuff in between and the new stuff to come. But listen to Jeff and Eric and rock on with Nothing Shocking. All right. Want to know what's going on in the world of music? Then tune in to the Nothing Shocking Podcast, a non-genre-based, all-ages friendly rock and roll program. Join us weekly for interviews with all your favorite rock stars from the mainstream to the underground. You can find us at nothingshocking.libsyn.com or anywhere you download podcasts. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These guys are 11. Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Untied, and with me in Dog Bowl Studios is... Coach Nez. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Lipson or any podcatchers. Like our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter at no Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. Our sponsor is... Ragged Records, located in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, and downtown Davenport, Iowa. We'd like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for allowing us to use their music for our intro and bumper ending. Tonight's guest is Joe Ellis and Mike Jaworski. Yeah, Joe Ellis, formerly of Cats and Boots, Heavy Bones, and now promoting his newly anticipated album, The Real Heavy Bones. And uh, Michael is his uh, producer that's working on him with all these uh, new tracks. Yeah, man, it sounds like an exciting project. Uh, it's so close to coming out. Let's get to that interview. All right, good night. Good night. Joel and Mike, welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'd like to reintroduce to you my co-host, Jeff Unteed. Hey, guys. This is Jeff. How are you doing tonight? Hey, hey man. How are, you, how are you guys doing again and again? Yeah. Well, you know, we, we have this line of communication between me and Joel. I get him, try to get him hooked up with good PR people and good, good mastering people. So hopefully those people work out for you. Oh, man. It's, it's unbelievable how helpful you've been through this whole entire process oh i mean it's like yeah i mean you're like uh jeff does he have a cape <laughs> yes he does <laughs> all right enough of this nonsense let's get on to this picture picture it didn't happen <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are currently working on the the real heavy bones album uh kink from the crypt can you give our listeners an insight on the creative process of this new endeavor? Ooh, okay. So, well, let me start off by saying that um, uh, this has been a box of tapes in my attic ever since the Heavy Bones days of, you know, while we were, we were, we were locked away in purgatory, just forced to write when they slide meals under the door and crack the whip on us. <laughs> <laughs> obviously i'm kidding but the uh yeah the process started um with the band itself it started out in la and um from the time that cats and boots broke up to um the time that heavy bones started um started with me and i started to mold a new band and um peter lopez my attorney had me uh, a deal with warner brothers before i ever even had the new band together so these songs or kind of a culmination of <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of eccentric characters coming through the mix, and eventually um, 
you know, after a few cattle calls and a bunch of different friends coming through and um, working in the home demo sections, uh, Gary Hilly and I connected. And, um, you know, so then he and I started crafting songs and then we decided, okay, yeah, this is a great character, you know, uh, uh, chemistry. So then from there we took it uh, to the uh, Frankie came in. I called Frankie, old buddy of mine. And so we basically these records, uh, these recordings started off on our little home machines <clears throat> um, in Hollywood, and then we evolved into the Satsuma Recording Building up in North Hollywood. And um, we did months of working on a Tascam 388 quarter-inch tape track machine. And uh, there's eight line strips in this old old machine, just. A great machine, novel machine. I, I wish they'd come back to making them, but everything's digital nowadays. But yeah, we we tracked everything live in the rehearsals, and we produced it ourselves. And we only had eight tracks to work with, so you know we threw four or five mics out in the room: vocals, guitar, bass, a couple mics on the drums, and that ate up about five tracks. And then we had um, we got real creative with bouncing tracks and editing in on different tracks. But the majority of it was all produced and recorded by the band on this little quarter inch tape machine in the rehearsal room. So yeah, that's where the product, that's where it started. And then, um, we had, I think it was somewhere like 60 songs or something like that or more. I mean, there were songs that just fell through the cracks along the way, but what I mean, what I had, um, you know, stored away for years was the, was the surplus of songs that didn't get on the heavy bones record. Okay. Really great songs as you, shall soon here and uh, so those sat for years and then the creative process started <clears throat> it actually started um i was living in it was I moved from la up to portland and portland was like a ghost town in terms of you know pro musicians or any type of professional outlet for a creative artist coming up from la and um but I, I got I kept getting calls from Dave Ponick from Warner Brothers. They actually talked to me a few times over the years and said, you know, Joel, that record really never got its legs. Do you want to reissue it? And there was some discord between, you know, the band members. And um, Frankie and I had kind of made our peace um, prior. And then he, but he got sick and passed away, unfortunately. And, uh, it was really, uh, it's a really sad note on my part, so I'm not going to go into it. But um, but yeah, so it got, you know, we had a couple of conversations about, Hey, you know, can we uh, go ahead and reissue this record together? Because I didn't want to do it with the current artwork on it. I, I really hated that. Oh, what would you call that artwork on the old record? That toothless clown with the horns. What is it? What do you say, Mike? I don't know. It's like some weird, cheesy, <laughs> wannabe tribal kind of <laughs> cartoon. Yeah. What about you guys? Eric, John, what, what, what do you guys think? Uh, Jeff, what do you guys think about, uh, that old cover yeah i mean is that an octopus or what is that thing <laughs> <laughs> it's jaws um and uh no but anyway so that was the thing um you know initially it was it was my my contract given to me on warner brothers but then i made a decision to split it with everybody in the band and i was more focused i had my head in the music and not really on the legal end of things and i yeah. wasn't really thinking negative down the road like what could possibly happen wasn't much of a pessimist in those days and yeah so it became a thing where warner brothers and well, we can't really sit unless everybody in the band agrees it's got to be a band decision i'm like holy shit did i let that happen <laughs> but um <laughs> but yeah so back in at that point in time um frankie and i were we were in agreement to release the record and change the artwork. And then Gary didn't want to do it. And so there was still a lot of tension between Gary and I back in the day. And then Frankie passed away and time passed. And then I got a call from Warner brothers and Dave Ponick was like, you know, Joel, let's, let's, let's get this out there. Why don't we just license you the independent, you know, the individual songs. Um, well, one step back, um, I, I, I told Dave, I said, you know, I have this whole box of rehearsal tapes. And I think I'll just get that out to the fans because I own these masters and nobody can stop me and I can do whatever I want. And if the fans want the music, I want to give it to them it's sitting in my attic and songs no one's ever heard before. So I'm just going to dump these tapes. I'm just going to dump them, digitize them and throw them on CD. And there you go, guys. <laughs> now, <laughs> then came Mike. <laughs> now, actually, actually what happened first was, um, 
I told Dave Ponick, this, I told Warner Brothers, I said, yeah, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do this. And there's about 40 or 50 songs and I'm probably going to end up having to release them on, you know, I wasn't thinking digital era and I still don't, but um, I'm slowly being convinced. But, you know, so Dave was like, well, why don't we just license you, uh, you know, the songs individually, you can mix them on and put that. So then I had the idea to do four volumes. I'll do, well, there's enough here to split into four volumes if I, you know, do two double album vinyl sets or CDs or whatever, yeah. and, you know, and then the rest of them I'll, I'll just dump out digital, you know. And so I called my good friend and um, engineer producer from Cats and Boots, Kicked and Claude, Garth Richardson. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Garth, Garth and I have done a lot of stuff. Like he tracked me the last thing I was up in British Columbia at his place doing the vocals for the Stone Temple Pilots thing that never transpired. But, um, you know, we've kept, kept in touch over the years, but I, um, but I don't work directly with him because he's way the fuck up in north of Alaska. So he's on a beautiful island called Gibbons Landing up in British Columbia. So he usually just farms me out to different people. And so I said, you know, where can I get this digits? He goes, well, there's only one guy, the go-to guy in Hollywood. That's Dan Johnson, you know, take your tapes down to him. And, and however foobar these recordings are, you know, if there's anybody who can resurrect them, Dan can do it because he invented the process. Mm-hmm. So I did. Took, you know, I took him over to Dan, and then I met Mike. Um, <laughs> and I'm in Cleveland, so I'm thinking to myself, well, I came back to Cleveland. I love this town. It's very music. It's very real. I'm going to have to find a place to um, to record, record these, uh, to digitize it and find a studio in Cleveland. Um, so anyways, I... Um, this has always been kind of a back burner kind of project for me. And um, so Bootsy and uh, Bootsy and Patty contacted me about this song that they needed. They say, Hey, can you whip me up a song for um, you know, this climate global warming summit in Glasgow? And um, I said, yeah, yeah. Boots, I'll see what I got. And so I came and I was looking for a studio that I could work in and I found the Def- funk. I said, okay, that's funky. Bootsy's funky. This sounds funky. <laughs> so, but lo and behold, I found um, a studio. The way I explain it is, yeah, it was a godsend meant to be. But um, I tell people, yeah, well, if I met this guy who's got, he lives out in the country with his, he's got chickens. And if, you, if I picked up his studio and just dropped it in the middle of Hollywood, nobody would, it you know, wouldn't miss a beat. It's uh, it's that good. So it's really a state of the art. And just so happens that um, it comes equipped with a, a brilliant, brilliant, uh, don't tell anybody I said this, but the guy's really, really skilled, talented, and a good buddy now. But um, I got him, uh, we're, um, <clears throat> we're kind of production partners now in this whole project. Um, Mike Jaworski, he's here with me today. Say hi, Mike. Oh, hello. So I got, I got suckered into this. I'm, now I'm, <laughs> I'm a partner now. Oh, <laughs> you guys got to see. Now, isn't it like digital audio is like same as paper contract, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got them locked in like a nickel on the dollar. I oh, it, oh, it's been quite the journey. <laughs> quite the journey. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> let's uh, pass the mic over to Jeff. He's got the next question for you guys. Well, when you, um, you yeah, when you guys started working together, what, uh, t- take us. Are you in the studio or you're at uh, at you're at your home or how's it work? Uh, yeah, my, well, yeah, Mike. Mike has. So you have to understand Cleveland. Um, metropolitan Cleveland is, it's actually a really great city on a small scale, which I love. And it's on the North coast, but this is where it all happened. Rock and roll. So it's a very, very intense music city, theatrical orchestras, rock and roll, everything It always has been. But then it's, um, as you get outside of Cleveland, you go into these different areas of the country. So it's kind of like farmland meets (laughs) big city. It's a little like New York, actually. It's like a mini New York. Really it is. Um, and uh, so Mike has this place out in the. I would say, wouldn't, wouldn't you say this is country? Ah, we're 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 suburban. <laughs> I mean, yeah, suburban with ten acre lot. Well, right? we're yeah, it's, it's it's an old farm town, so it's uh, it, it's still got a little bit of that history to it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's cool. It's uh, like Green Acres, you know. <laughs> da-da, da-da. <laughs> but um, he does, and he actually has chickens. It blows my mind. <clears throat> but he has a big chicken coop. And then uh, behind the, you know, further back on the property is this very unassuming 
structure. Then you walk in and it's almost like, boof, you're in Hollywood you nice. know, production level. But he sunk a ton of money into this thing. And he, I don't know, like, where did you get the ideas for the design for this place? Um, I don't know, just something that we think we've always been just kind of fascinated with, just, you know, being a kid growing up music wise in, in Cleveland and, you know, like a lot of, you know, other young guys just, you know, hey, we're in a band and then we're like, oh, we'll record ourselves and sitting in mom's basement with an eight track or four track yeah. and wrote, wrote some really shitty recordings and just kind of, you know, kind of grew from there. And, um, you know, we, uh, you know, kind of built our first studio and that did well. And then we, you know, kind of outgrew it. And then when we moved out, we moved out here, you know, we were just kind of expanding and, you know, want our own building and, just kind of wanted to maintain a little bit of that uh, kind of intimacy, you know, kind of vibe. I mean, our, our whole mentality or, you know, you hear has been like the way recording should be. And I think, you know, kind of growing up as kids, we'd go into these, some of these commercial spaces and you start feeling like you're watching the clock and it's weird. And, you know, cause we're, you know, your kids growing up in, you know, in the basement and garage, that's what we kind of mm-hmm. played with. So we wanted to just kind yeah, of maintain that vibe. Yeah. We just kind of want to maintain yeah. that vibe, that comfort level vibe, obviously bringing the, you know, the pro level to it, but you know, just, I want, I wanted the clock to disappear, just come in, be creative and, and that's probably the biggest thing I've noticed about about here and working with you. I mean, I don't know if it's the well, first time when I was doing the single for Bootsy. No, it wasn't like that. You, <laughs> you were a motherfucker <laughs> with a fucking clock. He, he was like, "What's that guy, Flavor Flav? That wears the clock around his neck." Yeah. But yeah, no, he scared me. He actually scared me. <laughs> well, because I, okay, to my to to Mike's defense, I brought in some. Very, well, I'll, I'll let Joel tell his version of the story, and then I'll give you the real. <laughs> yeah, the real story. Uh, let's, let's just say that. Let's just say that. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I, I I took a couple of days to write songs. With, I didn't. Of course, I'm not in the network here, so I came home and I picked. You know, I picked a couple of people that were <clears throat> were there, and I had some great background singers came. Oh yeah, some girls. Absolutely. Yeah, the one girl uh, actually is a writer uh, for Warner Brothers. She's a staff writer, but she's a great singer, and, um, and they had some soul. But, um, yeah, I had a younger kid come in with piano. He was great. I, I took him out, played live with him and a group of guys. We just, we did some little, <laughs> some little show for, um, a nine 11 tribute. The city asked us to play. So I was like, okay, we'll do it. And threw together a quick band and he played and, and it was great. But when we got him in the studio, of course, you know, it took, like, I don't know, what, four or five hours for him to, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and he, we, he crumbled under the pressure. So uh, naturally, so did my budget. <laughs> Crumbled <laughs> under the pressure of Mike. Yeah, you know, it was like the prison guards. And you know, listen, dude. Yeah, I think it was more. I think it was more the. Um, I think it was more you dealing with the piecing of the song together that kind of I wasn't prepared for. But 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 anyways, I found the studio, <clears throat> and you know the Bootsy single thing. You know, it went off okay. We got it done. Um, but then when I told him about this project, Mike was like, wow, Frankie Minnelli, really? He, he, I grew up a drummer. Frankie was my God, yeah. you know? <laughs> and um, so I, we made a deal to work on this record together. And it's, he's done, well, we've produced some pretty amazing, it's just, these songs have taken on a whole new life. Um, they're huge. Yeah. I mean, all I really, uh, all I really intended to do was to, to take the songs that were in live rehearsal, rare recordings, captured the band, uh, playing live. This is the way that we wanted to produce them. This is the way that we wrote them. We recorded them live recordings and in our own little environment, just us. Mm-hmm. And it, there's a magic to just to that. And there's a magic to these songs and the performances because we're just, we're relaxed, we're ourselves and we're rocking the fuck out. Nice. And, you know, so now we bring it into Mike's world, and he's such a freaking fanatic. He takes Frankie's drum tracks. He took these these shitty old analog tapes, and he isolated every one of Frankie's drum kicks. And, I mean, everything, every tom, every cymbal, every, isolated everything, every... You know, you clean. I don't know how you do that whole Pro Tools thing. You guys out there that know Pro Tools, you don't know what the hell's going on. But you explain kind of the process a little bit, Mike. Um, well, Let's pass this over. Well, yeah, I guess. I mean, when the when the project came in, it was just you know eight track recording, right? So we're we're dealing with eight tracks. You know, a band in a room. You know, so it's there's a uh, two mics on a drum kit, which is kind of quasi overheads or a room mic, and it's picking up the guitar amps and the bass, and you know we got like one guitar track to work with and. You know, a couple of vocal tracks and everything's a little bit, you know, different. And I think the original 
you know, concept or idea was, hey, let's just take these raw demo recordings, get like kind of a, you know, quasi mix on them and, and put those out. And I think when I first started hearing them, you know, like the, you know, like the kick drum was there, but it was very, like it was all attack. There was like no body, you know, in the, in the kick and it sounded very thin. And I'm hearing these, um, you know, these Frankie Benali, you know, drum tracks that no one's heard before. And yeah. it was, you know, kind of a, a, you know, a bit surreal. And I was like, well, let's start with, I said, I think I can make this kick drum sound a little better. So I had a strong enough, like, you know, transient in the recording. We kind of went through just because it, there's nothing to the grid. There's no grid. There's no click. This is all, you know, analog <laughs> stuff. Mm -hmm. So literally going through one by one and grabbing every transient and taking that in and then layering in and building a sample and kind of blending in that, that sample with the... And cleaning out the bleed. Yeah, cleaning out the bleed. I mean, obviously doing some, you know, some some studio, you know, trick work where, you know, doubling tracks and processing one one way and processing another track another way and layering that in. And then we kind of build the kick up. And you're like, okay, that changes the whole, you know, dynamic of the, the track. And you're like, well, now the snare sounds like shit. <laughs> so now, now we got to do that to, you know, to the snare. And then you're like, okay, now the drums sound big and the guitars are a little thin. So we only have one... It was the guitar was only like single tracks and now we got to figure out a way to kind of do some routing and busing and uh you know bumping tracks around without getting phase cancellation and thicken up the guitars make it sound like the guitars were you know bigger than they actually were and you know and then then the, you know and then it, it just kind of grew from there and then the tom sounded thin so now we got to do the same thing with all the, all the tom hits and um you know and then now we're like hey let's do this so now we got to make the vocals a little bigger and mm. so it just it was all this kind of studio production work and, you know, and then doing some stuff to the, you know, the bass and kind of dealing with the, the eight tracks that we had to deal with. Um, and then just, yeah, just really is kind of, it just took on a life of its own. Every time you kept doing one thing, you're like, well, we've done that. We got to do this now. And yeah. you know, we got to do that. So it just, it, it kept going and you're like, Oh, like, yeah. And, and what's, what's 20 more hours? <laughs> <laughs> it's been, it's been hundreds and yeah. maybe thousands of hours. Yeah. I mean, it's been over the course of a couple of years. Like I brought this project to Mike back in, uh, God was it like, well, so we did the Bootsy track in November and then we started working on this thing right after Christmas. And, uh, so it's been, uh, yeah. Shit, man. It's got a couple of years. Wow. Me too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Have <clears throat> but it feels like 30, but you know, we decided like, yeah. And remember what he's talking about is we, it started with like, we had shit, you know, just regular shit microphones. We had SM 57s and 58s. So I think we had like, a, I, I think I may have had like one or two other microphones from my home studio, but we were, we were just in a big room. I mean, <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't in a recording studio. We were in a room that started off as a machine shop. You know, back, I found that room right around the corner from Mates in North Hollywood. I found it, um, Mary Hoax, when we were on Atlantic Records. Uh, Atlantic Records gave us a budget. So we went out and, you know, we couldn't get into Mates or, we, or uh, SIR. So, I mean, for any block out time. So we just went and found an old machine shop. And the guy was excited to have a band in there. It was right around the corner from Mates, right in the corner of Satsuma and Burbank. I think it was Burbank, hmm. somewhere up in there. But, um, but yeah, man, he, he cleaned it out, got all the oil and mes metallic shavings off the ground. And we started rehearsing in there back in 86 with Mary Hoax and then came back with cats and boots and a little bigger budget and did some sound insulation and then, uh, came back with heavy bones and it was a nice rehearsal room, but we still a couple of overhead, put a, a kick, put a mic on Frankie's kick and, and one overhead mic right above you know, right above his snare, I guess it was, and it captured the cymbals and the tom and everything else like that. And with Frankie, I mean, it's just like a wall of sound anyway. So there's, it's easy to get the uh, the attack on all those hits that he was doing with one microphone. But Mike was the genius that isolated them all. And then, you know, 57 on on Gary's amp and uh, one on Rex's bass. Nothing went. Nothing was di'd. Nothing was direct. And then me singing the vocals. And then we went back and we did some guitar overdubs and I did some vocals and we did some background and, but there was no like, okay, let's repunch this. It's all captured live in terms of, you know, drums, bass, guitar and, and lead vocal. And, you know, unless there was some like intense, uh, you know, mistake or something that we did, I don't ever remember going in and punching any of those main tracks. But then we did have fun doing some overdubs, get Gary's oh, yeah. guitar solos for the most part, and uh, the background vocals, et cetera. So that's where it all started, and then what Mike, you know, what Mike said. <laughs> <laughs>
when you were going through all the tracks, were did you were you able to salvage all of them, or were there any tracks that you're like, man, this just isn't going to work. We're going to have to re-record this part or something. Was there anything like that? Okay, so yeah, there's a there's a couple stories. Here. There's, a, there's quite a few stories. Um, so first of all, yeah, in terms of salvaging the tapes, we really, really owe a lot of gratitude to Dan Johnson. Yeah. And by the way, if you don't know who Dan Johnson is. You should. Anybody in the music industry should at this point because Dan was a, back in the day, was a staff engineer over at Oceanway Studios. And when the whole digital thing hit, um, you know, there was a, there was a big issue and there still is. I mean, um, with going analog, the original analog tapes to digital. Well, Dan was given the task and he, he actually, um, created and perfected that whole process of going analog to digital. You know, you, you take the tapes and you have to bake them and you bake them. I'm not going to tell you the recipe here, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we know the recipe. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> sounds scary to me. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you, it, it is scary. I mean, that doesn't, that's no shit. It is scary because you're taking these one of a kind original and not just music, but film all the, yeah the old celluloid films, you know, all the audio tapes. I mean, I'm talking like tapes all the way back. When I went to Dan, uh, he squeezed me in between Eric Burden's, uh, Eric Burden's war, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> where they were doing spill the wine, spill the wine, mm -hmm. get that girl. Old tape, the old two inch master tapes. I mean, when they get so old, basically what happens is, is you know, the oxide that uh, it's a magnetic resonance tape. And so it picks up, you know, it imprints it on this, this oxide, magnetic oxide that's on the tape. And it, it gets old and it crumbles. And if it crumbles, there goes the recording. Mm, the recording yeah. crumbles with it. And so what Dan did was, um, like I said, when I went to him, you know, Garth Richardson referred me to Dan and it was like a friend thing and went in and I talked to Dan and he asked what we're doing. And I said, yeah. So um, I ended up literally like, filling my car up trunk back seat passenger seat with master reels of master tapes that I had not just for the heavy bones, but my solo record and all these other things, you know, two inch tapes, quarter inch tapes, all blah, 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 cassettes. And <laughs> so literally on a flatbed, we wheeled them up Dan and I from the parking lot, we wheeled them up and came in and he was like, Holy shit, Joel, you said you had, <laughs> but anyways, um, I actually physically got to hold, the tape of Eric Burden's and war spill the wine, get that girl. I mean, I was holding that, that thing, you know, and then I was whole, I was, you know, they had all the kiss, you know, early kiss kiss had all their masters. He was digitizing. So dressed to kill hotter than hell. They were all right there. So mm. my music got digitized right in between that. And oh, nice. so, yeah, it was cool. Um, but, um, but anyways, um, so yeah, that's, that was to answer the first part of your question to salvage the tapes. Um, you know, Dan does the job. You bake the tapes and then for a certain period of time to get them pliable and, and then you run the tapes and you might have one or two passes at getting, you know, getting all of the, uh, you know, just getting all, get, getting the tape and it's pristine quality. You got maybe if you can even do that, you got one or two takes and then the tape crumbles apart again, but you have to bake it and then you have to do it in so much period of time. So he did all that. And then, um, he transferred all the files here to to uh, to Mike's studio, so he and Mike did the transfer. And what we came to find was is that so in order for him to be able to digitize my tapes for this record, I had to I had to get I had to go out and find a Tascam 388. And keep in mind there there's only a few all over the world, but keep in mind that you can't ship these things. <laughs> you can't ship them. You can't bounce them around. <laughs> They're old machines with tape heads, and there's a lot of intricate, you know, hard wiring inside. You've got line strips. You've got – are there tubes in that thing? No, there's no tubes in there. It's all transformer. It's all transformer. But they're delicate machines, and people try to find them. And if you find one that's even in somewhat decent shape, you know, you have to actually go and pick it up and have it transported and everything. So I found one down at Costa Mesa that had been completely refurbished. I happen to think it's my original machine. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but anyways, these things, they go right now for like five or six grand. And half the time they're in shoddy condition. But I found some great guys at this uh, this pawn shop where the guy's passionate about old recording machines. And he got this thing and he had it 
completely refurbished. And he said, this one is like in the best shape that I've ever found one. And then he went and he had it all tweaked and dialed in. And, and then um, he was a fan. And so I talked to him and I said, hey, I, I want that machine. I'll drive down. I was up in Portland. And I said, I'll drive down to Costa Mesa and get it. And then I'll drive it back east. And that's exactly what I freaking did, man. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got, and I didn't have a, you know, bit my, the car I used was my, uh, was my 330, my 335i, and I didn't have a big trunk in it, you know, or whatever. So what I did was I went and found this enormous blanket, you know, and I padded the whole bottom of my trunk, and the trunk on my 335 was, uh, was just big enough for this thing to fit. I mean, just big enough, just wide enough to squeeze in there. But I went down there and I picked it up from this guy and um, it was in excellent shape. And then I took it up to Dan's in Burbank and I said, I have the machine with the tapes. He's like, oh my God, I've always wanted to work with one of these. You know, people ask me all the time, you know, can I do these old tricks? Because so many people are screwed. You know, they bought, you know, they were doing, they bought those machines and they're doing all this stuff. And then they upgraded to all this newfangled shit. And then this machine, nobody could find them anymore. Now everybody's looking for them. But I've got the best one in the world because it went, from having like I don't know the state of the art you know tweaking and, and refurbing um, over to Dan dialing it in you know for like all the just all the the tape gears all everything he said the only thing that's kind of iffy on it is the Dolby but nobody uses that shit anyways <laughs> and <laughs> Dolby um, Dolby and um, but. Um, so we, um, we got it back here and we found that there were some songs, like there was a song, like I, I kept telling my, like, Oh wait, there's this one song. Uh, I'll be thinking of you. It's just this little, just kind of a ballad, but you know, at the end of it, Gary shreds his ass off. It reminds me of like, uh, uh, comfortably numb by Pink Floyd it goes in this massive and it's this killer, killer ballad. It's moving. And so we kept, I kept talking about the guitar solo at the end and we get through and then he goes, Hey, we got a problem. There's no solo i go what do you mean there's no solo <laughs> there's no solo <laughs> so we we um here what did we do mike oh, yeah we, yeah we were, we were tracking it we were playing it and he's like there's a guitar solo here i'm like no there's not and we had to go through all the tracks he's like are you sure and i'm like no and we we're going through all the files i'm like it's not there and uh oh, i was like no. it did transfer and he's like i know we played it and so we ended up uh i think we ended up calling dan johnson and uh, like, hey, we got the tracker. Like he had us on Zoom. Yeah, it, we were really on Zoom. We we're like, uh, I'm like, what are the chances that this didn't bounce or something like that? And he's like, you know, it's a possibility. We, you know, we're checking the notes, and he's like, I mean, yeah, I think even him, he's just like, yeah, we doubt it. And yeah, we, uh, we, and we're it like, yeah, like can we try running it again. Like we got the machine here, and uh, so he he gave us the process. He was he was gracious enough to you know tell us the actual you know the, the secret sauce, the yeah. stuff, and we had to go out and get the equipment for it. And we, we, you know, we ran through the process and, and again, it is like a nerve wracking thing because the tapes are fragile. They've already been run and here we are literally baking it. Yeah, you know? Again, again, again. So and, this is uh, going through the second baking process, yeah. the second on the tape. And, uh, you know, we went through on the tape and just, you know, as precaution, we went through and just, you know, clean all the contacts, you know, any oxidation that was on there. And, you know, and but we, we, fig we figured out it, that it, it's like, wait a minute, everything that we're, that we're hearing that's dropping out seems to be on the same track. Yeah. It was on you the know, same what track. What if it's a contact? You know, yeah. Okay. It, it sounded more like a, it sounded more like a, a know, loose like, wire, like a loose wire yeah, as, like as opposed to like a, a head drop. And we're like, maybe that's it. And <laughs> so yeah, we, we brought it in and then I'm ready to, I've got it all set up, ready to go. And Joel's all nervous and worried and he comes in the studio and he's like he's like all right we got to light some sage in here no like, no it's a white mountain sage. Yeah, we got to like smudge he's like we got to smudge. smudge with white mountain sage yeah right? man we did the whole ceremony like, the i even burned i even shit. burned some copal uh copal negra from peru we, we went and i went around he was he, he was sage. vehemently against the smudge <laughs> he's like you're not burning that shit in here i'm like dude let me tell you and the same thing happened in the heavy bones tracking over at the music grinder in hollywood the board went down and those guys were all laughing at me, Richie Zito and, and Phil Caffel and, and, and Frankie and Gary. Everybody, they were laughing at me. Like, oh, get that goofy shit out of here. Well, go ahead, Joel. Light your shit while we're waiting for the tech to show up. And I shit you not, I got a bowl and I got some, some white mountain sage that I had you know, learned about this because I used to go to uh, Native American Indian prayer sweats back in the day. I, I was into it. But, and I still am, okay? Um, but 
I took this ball and I went and I laid on my back under this giant SSL 4000 board. And I'm like, ho, wonk, on tonk. <laughs> and I'm floating and I'm smudging the whole thing. And they're cracking up and laughing. And all of a sudden, I shit you not, you can ask anybody. The board just went whoop, like someone flipped the switch and the whole thing came back on. So I told Mike, I said, hey, man. You know, and uh, it, it, back then it shut everybody up. I lit up the board. We went on. We didn't even need the text. I said, let's try it. He's all right, fine. You know, so I did it. And then lo and behold, what happened, Mike? We tracked it and it, the guitar solo suddenly appeared. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's a Christian man sitting here. Now, you swear to God that that's the truth. That's, yeah. that's what happened. <laughs> All right. I mean, I, cool. I will give you, I will give you my scientific alternative for what, but no, that's that's what happened. Let me say, Jim, uh, it was there. Like I said, yeah. Even Dan Johnson was just like, he's like, yeah, you can try, but I doubt it. And lo and behold, yep. we ran it, and it was there. there and the go. solo came back in all of its glory. Seriously, did. Next question is from Mike. So, your your work as a producer, um, can you talk a little bit about more of having to co-produce this album with Joel himself? How has this process went for you? Oh, man. you know, it's so, I mean, I mean, being completely honest and candid, I mean, it's um, like any creative process. It is uh, it's been very fun, very rewarding, but also incredibly you know, frustrating, you know, but I think that also just points to anytime you're doing anything, you know, you know, creative. Um, I mean, it, as much as, you know, I think Joel and I can get at each other's nerves, uh, but I think we have a, you have a really good working relationship because we, we, we push each other, you know, right. You know, mm -hmm. so it's, um, you know, there's, you know, I have that initial thing of like, wait, do you hear what I have? I've done all this with eight tracks. Right? Isn't this good enough? And then you, you know, tend to forget that right. where it started. Right. Yeah, so you forget it, but then, but, but then you start hearing stuff and then Joel will be like, well, can you do this? And let's push that. And then I'm like, you know, and I'm like, all right, fine. And then, then we get into it. And it's just, we keep kind of bouncing back and forth of each other. Just, you know, I'll do something and then it inspires him and, you know, he'll hear it and you're like, Oh, can we do this? And well, we got to do this now. And, and there's, there's a lot of that, you know, back and forth of, uh, you know, just kind of pushing each other and pushing that envelope and then, you know, really getting granular. And, and it's, it's, it's literally gotten to a point where we're not treating it like an eight track recording. And I'm treating oh, it's this, a whole new animal. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm treating this, you know, as if I had any other you know, artists come in here and we're doing 30, 40, 50, 60 tracks. Yeah. You know, it's, it's now it's to that degree, you know, and, and we'll, we'll pause and reflect and go back and like, those vocals recorded on SM58. You know, yeah. Or, or, I mean, we're, 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 we, 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 don't, we don't treat it like that. I mean, we're pushing it. No, like, it's amazing. Yeah, you it's, keep pushing it. To like, it's so easy to get low. It looks like we went down Alice's rabbit hole and uh, <laughs> came up through another one. <laughs> no, um, it, it really is. It's like a whole other studio production. And the other day I said to my, I said, you know what? On my website, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put AB. Here's where it started and here's where it came out. And it's going to blow people's minds. And, you know, I mean... Uh, you know, my, uh, my web guy was even saying, he goes, Hey man, I'm, I'm like a real freak with all these audio engineering magazines, things like that. He says, what you guys are doing ought to be, you ought to be doing interviews with like the engineering, the, yeah. you know, the mm -hmm. technology magazines, mm -hmm. and letting people know, because, and even Dan said, and, and Garth and these guys, you know, they, you know, they said, you know what, wow, you know what you're doing. Everyone I talked to, like, you know, Mauer Applebaum, I was telling him Applebaum, he's going to be doing mastering on this and. I was telling him about the process and everybody I talked to was just like, holy shit, really? Like that's gotta, but then if you listen to the record without telling anybody what we've been through and, and what this is, mm -hmm. they just go, that is a kick-ass record. Oh my God. It sounds so good. Where'd you guys record it? And they just laugh. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right. You want to know? So, okay. Well in there, there's a little envelope message in there that Mike and I, um, be on this project we're also going to be we've decided since we have such a great working relationship um that uh, we're going to we're going to continue on as a production team and nice. we're going to offer our services to produce other acts because um you know i think that my enormous right brain and <laughs> his intense left brain together we we make this in it's like a perfect uh, combination and we i've never really worked with um with an engineer who hears or allows me or entertains, like just, just humor me for a second. You know, the guy does it from the beginning of the session to the end. Like, okay, Joel, you hear something. What? Like what? And like, all right, let me see if I can do it. And then he'll like come back tenfold on something so fucking cool. I'll be like, wait, he's like, but wait, wait, I hear it here. And then it's like, we're two kids 
and I feel like I'm a teenage kid again, nice. you know, in the basement, you know, recording demos and learning how to, it's, it's been exciting. So we're going to, we're going to continue on that way. And, you know, when, when the time comes, we're going to produce, when we're done with my stuff in about 10 years, <laughs> I think, <laughs> I've only got about, what, 15 masters ready to go. Well, yeah, well, I, just to, to follow on what, what, what we were talking about earlier, was, was there any tracks that you had to uh, maybe re-record any parts? Yeah, there's actually been uh, quite a bit. So obviously with these tracks originating as, um, you know, as rehearsals and writing demos, the whole, the whole objective back in the day in the 90s was to, um, we'd take the songs that we'd written and we'd bring them in and rehearse the shit out of them. And if we didn't, if we didn't think they were good or we weren't going to do them, we'd just kind of drop it right there or we wouldn't finish it, this or that, and move on to the next cut. Um, so a lot of those songs ended up now sounding like, hey, well, that was that's not exactly a throwaway. Um, we had one that was like the original version of Turn It On, and it was called Say Goodbye. And I was just like, oh, yeah, toss that one. And Mike would be like, well, wait a minute. If we bring in and we put more vocals down in this and add this or that, you know, so we did um, add tracks. I've gone in and I've redone some vocals, added some vocals. Um, in fact, I'm about to actually... Um, you know, re-sing a lot of the background harmonies for Your Love Won't Let Me Down that are on there because there's some, some big ones. So we did the song, we liked the song, and then we took it in the studio back in the 90s and we turned it into a mega production. Well, we never got a chance to do that here, so now we're having fun doing that here in our own way of doing it. Nice. And there was, um, Gary and I have actually made up, um, Warner Brothers was actually very instrumental at putting us back in touch with each other and uh, a lot of time has passed and hard feelings under the bridge and Gary and I had a really great heart to heart talk and you know it's like we're getting along great we're having great conversations and um, we're really enjoying our friendship again and you know the possibility of, of maybe approaching some live shows together nice. in the future or making new recordings together in the future I mean I'm open to it um, you know I can't say enough about, you know, what's going on here with Gary and I, because it's just been like years, decades of carrying this heavy negative weight on my shoulders. Uh, and then he was just, just like, you know, Hey dude, I'm so sorry for everything. And, you know, we can, you know, and so anyways, make a long story short, he's put down some new guitar tracks and he sent them to me. He's out in New Hampshire. So he's got his little studio there. So I'll be like, Hey, you know, here's the wave file stereo take. What do you think? And okay, I'll throw this down. He'll beef up the guitars and send them back. And and um, one song in particular that I want to talk about is, you know, my very first band in Hollywood, my first major label deal on Atlantic Records was with my high school band from Cleveland. They were called Mary Hoax. Yeah. And uh, or the Hoax. And you know, we were a badass band out of Bedford, <laughs> Ohio, but um, Grizz, my bass player from Atlantic Records, our guitarist, Denny, he, um, he overdosed. Um, we lost him. And, uh, and so I went on to do Cats and Boots and Rough Cut and a bunch of other yeah. stuff after Mary Hooks with Atlantic. But Grizz is here in Cleveland. And so I, we had a track, Your Love Won't Let Me Down, mm -hmm. and it didn't have a bass track at all. There was no bass track on it. Yeah, yeah it's the only one that we found with no bass track. The only one. And so naturally I just called Grizz. And what's really funny is, is that Grizz and I had just touched base and reconnected after all these years. And, you know, um, so, um, I mean, that was, that's really been a joy too, is reconnecting with all these guys that I used to create with. Mm -hmm. And Cleveland was really huge for that, the vibe here. But Grizz came in, I called him, I said, Hey, listen, man, uh, you know, you come in and put a bass track down and your love won't let me down is a seven minute song. And it's, <laughs> not exactly the easiest song to play but it's not the worst but you know Grizz has always been an amazing player he you know he was influenced by the best of the best out of the 70s you know Entwistle and Getty Lee and John Paul Jones and just you know he grew up as a kid on all that stuff so he came in listened to the song a few times and just pounded out a bass line and so it's kind of cool because now we've got a track that has Grizz from Mary Hoax playing bass on it and um, all, and what's also very cool talking about bass tracks is that I don't know if a lot of people know this, but I 
was vehemently against doing the heavy bones recording in the studio with reprise to a click track. I had never worked to a click track before. I didn't believe in them. You know, a child of the seventies, fuck click tracks. Who even thinks <laughs> like that? Well, you know, um, but we did it and it was sad because it stripped the band of our natural groove. Oh yeah. And you know, so, and that included Rex. And so Frankie was professional enough to be able to play to a click, but it wasn't, I mean, it, it's to me, the, the click sucked the life of the band out. You get this magic groove that a band naturally has. And so Rex was part of that. And we got into the studio and Rex was such a groove monster that he just, he didn't fit the click, I guess. I don't know, but the, you know, the label, the producer started and said, ah, oh, he's not, he can't, he can't hang in the groove or he can't play to the click, you know? So anyways, this recording has Rex laying down his groove. It has the band playing in our groove without a click track. It has the, this is the real, you know, it couldn't be a more perfect name. This is the real heavy bones, not heavy bones, the band that's had their groove stripped away with a <laughs> click track, you know, and not, some session player to come in and play the tracks over what Rex played. I think Rex was brilliant. And so there was only one person I could think of who could re, you know, replace his bass track in this. And that was Grizz, you know, from Mary Hoax. So he came in and he just, just knocked it out of the fucking park, man. He's just a killer player. So that should answer your question as to we're still, you know, we've embellished on these recordings and then we've taken the concept. I think, I think uh, just to another level, like we've been adding things like, I, I think just, you know, just to go off that though, I, I still think it's important to say that like, but still the essence of the eight tracks, the original recordings are still there. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a lot of like, obviously studio tricks and production that we've done to it. Um, but I mean, this still essence of the band that's there, the stuff that we've, that we've done to it. Uh, I mean, I think Rex, you know, playing on that one, tr or not, I'm sorry, Grizz. Uh, Grizz playing on that one track is probably one of the biggest, you know, you know, additions to it. Um, Obviously, in Say Goodbye, we did a lot of, uh, you know, we did like a gang vocal yeah, session. Yeah, we brought in background singing. And, uh, yeah, that was, it was, was fun. Yeah, we had about 20 people <laughs> doing that. <laughs> and chicken. Uh, and chicken. <laughs> and then we, uh, and, then, and then it's, the other stuff has been like, yeah, like, I think adding, um, you know, some, some additional like backing vocals or harmony. Uh, on your website, I saw you had Real Heavy Bones, uh, Volume 1, uh, for pre-order. What, what's your plans for physical product? Yeah, so... You know, and I'd like to shout it out there. If there's anybody out there that has web skills, I, I really need some support with that. You know, I'm old school. I don't know the first damn thing about building a website, but I've started working um, with um, um, a guy that's kind of, he, he has a lot going on. And we started to build the website. And I just, I put up a post and um, I have like a bunch of orders coming in. In fact, you guys are, Whoever placed your first orders, you're getting everything cheap because it was just an example. But I'm going to honor all of those orders that came in for 11 bucks. I mean, it cost me that much to get the damn things made. But I might make a buck or two on it. Those, so I, I got to kick the prices up. I mean, everything. Hey, the price of milk and eggs is high. So, yep. you know. But the thing about the pre-order is this. And I really want to make this message clear to the fans. It's uh, what we're making right now is very, very worthy of, of high fidelity, you know, recording. So I want to be able to do the mastering. We have to find mastering now, um, a process that's going to uh, really do this justice. We can't just do your standard mastering on this. We've got to um, work with a top top shelf mastering, which means, um, you know, which means, um, somebody, you know, somebody in the business in, in LA. So we, we decided on, on going with Mayor Applebaum, who's, he's done all the yes records, faith, no more, and, and a bunch of records. Like he's done hundreds of records. So, um, it means time. So we, you know, the, a lot of these is a, a time turnaround process. So what I've decided to do is just so that I can get the music out to the fans, we're going to go ahead and release it for digital download <clears throat> and you'll be able to buy the entire record by digital download. Um, but I would highly recommend, uh, I would highly recommend setting some money aside for the vinyl record. We're going to yeah. do a limited edition mm. and the vinyl mastering, cause you really want to be able to get the most out of this. Um, I'm going to put it out there on CD if anybody still buys CDs, but 
the uh, the digital mastering and the analog mastering for vinyl are two different animals, and it's uh, it's a it's a I don't it's it takes a lot of skill. It's a it's it's a high level process to do the right mastering. All the records I've ever done in the past have been with one of two guys, and that's he's been through the entire 70s as George Marino uh, at Sterling Sound, New York, or um, Career. But now there's a lot of guys that can do it, and, and we're going to use Mayor, and it's going to take a little time to get that record out. So the pre-order is if you're placing your order for the vinyl, I'm only making a thousand copies of that record, and they'll all be autographed, and they're going to be a nice package. Um, but if you put your money in now and buy the record, please don't write me every week and say, when's my record coming out? <laughs> yeah. Just know that you're, you're securing your place, your seat on that thousand records, because it will be 1,000 copies of a picture disc of a great 180 mil vinyl record that nice. has premier mastering on it. And that's what the pre-orders are about. You'll be able to go in and... Um, and as soon as we, we still have to master, we still have to do the mastering for the digital as well. But the vinyl is going to take time because you have to also cut it, master it. You have to cut it, manufacture it, press it. It takes time. And you don't want to rush something like that. So that's what the pre-order is about. And so the store, um, I'm, uh, I'm in between web guys right now to build out the store and I'm working on it. So just have patience with me. So what that translates to is maybe a few more weeks. It may come out a month late, maybe mid-July, but it's going to be well worth the wait. And if you want, I'll reopen the store, and we can go in and uh, well, let's see. When is this going to air? Because this will this air in a couple into... weeks. Yeah, this will be about three weeks. Okay, so yeah, so if you're here in this mid-July, then the, then you should be able to come to joelellismusic.com, come in the store. You should be able to buy it. Fantastic. And um, you should also be able to download all my other records, all the the obscure stuff from Japan with oh, Cats nice. and Boots, the Mary Hoax record. I highly recommend the Mary Hoax record because um, those are some rare songs. And I'm going to keep digging. I'm going to keep digging. I'm going to eventually put together, I'm going to pull audio tracks off of all the old Cats and Boots, uh, live video recordings of all of our classic shows in Japan. And eventually I'm going to make all those available and you know, I don't you know, people buy live records anymore, but I'm sure oh, yeah. the fans will dig oh, it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. You know, and then I've got um, I got a, my solo record, Ellis Island. That's going to be a collaboration for Peace with the Russian artist Yuldis. Hmm. So you can check her out. Um, and if you go to Yuldis U L D U S Yuldis dot com, hmm. you'll see who she's a she, she's like a top fashion photographer with Vogue and um, her. Her phot photography art is in museums, and she's crafting something around my solo record. And oh, we're doing a nice. collaboration nice. for peace. Yeah, she's a Russian artist. I'm a U.S. rocker. She says we're going to piss many people off, <laughs> <laughs> but she's my sweetheart. Yeah, and um, you can check her out. Fantastic. But that's um, that's coming down the pike this year as well. All right. Well, this is how it's going to work out. Jeff, the editing wizard, will get this all cleaned up and make it sound all pretty for you guys. Sound good? Yep. Yeah. Do you want to get a final statement from Mike or anything like that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I'm not. I guess I'm, so, I'm, the, so, I'm the left brain guy. I'm the, not the, the other, future. Sure. What the future holds for Mike and yeah. I is uh, so we're we're gonna finish working on this record. We're gonna release this volume one get, mm -hmm. to get it out, um, and then we decided to release these in volumes. We're not gonna do it songs as they come, but yeah. Mike and I are gonna take a little break, clear our heads, and then we're going to come back for volume two, which is also eight tracks, and then volume three is the two tracks, right, Mike? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, volume one and volume two are going to be the, you know, all the eight-track recordings on the Tascam 388, um, and then, yeah, volume three will be all the two-track kind of demos mm -hmm. from, I guess, from you guys back yeah. in the day and in the apartment and all yeah. that other stuff, so crazy stuff. Kind, of, kind of more unique stuff. Living with like Piercy and all those yeah. crazy Tammy and everybody in there. <laughs> wow, who knows what's in those recordings? Mm. Um, yep, and I do have an announcement to the fans. You guys have been asking for the uh, reprise version, the Warner Brothers version of the Heavy Bones record, and uh, I have reached an agreement with Warner Brothers and Gary, and we are reissuing it. Nice. And um, we're going to do a, some remastering on that, and it's coming to you with bonus tracks and a new song order and 
yay, a new cover art. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So that's going to come right after volume one. Well, all we're going to do is uh, Warner Brothers sent us the, sent me the wave files, and so I just piece them together, and it's going to come out a lot quicker. And um, so you'll have volume one, and then you'll have the Warner Brothers reprise uh, reissue, and then volume two and three to follow, and then more exciting Joel stuff after that. Mm-hmm. Man, you Joel got and Mike stuff. Yeah. You, you got us excited. So, right, right. yeah. So w- this will be out in three weeks, and uh, then Jeff will get it all cleaned up and share it wherever you guys can. We appreciate your time and excellent. Sounds great, man. All yeah. right. Well, yeah. Keep me abreast of what's going on, and man, good. we've been enjoyed talking to you again. All right, man. All right, guys. We'll keep you two breasts. Of, we'll keep you two breasts and uh, <laughs> Mike's breast, my breast, <laughs> chicken breast, chicken breast. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, guys. Take her easy. All Have right. a good one. Thanks a lot. Okay, Thanks. take care. Good Thanks, night. Bye. 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 Good night.
Take from you, then you plug out both the 